Only 160 miles west of the Italian peninsula, Sardinia would be one of Rome's first overseas provinces. Yet despite this proximity, it was also one of the few that were never truly pacified. Its rugged highlands, malarial lowlands, and fiercely independent natives would keep its occupiers on their toes for the seven centuries they reigned on the island. Long before becoming part of the Roman province of Sardinia et Corsica, this island of silver veins was known to the Phoenicians as Shardana. The Bronze Age collapse of the 12th century BC greatly weakened the Egyptians and Hittites, allowing the seafaring Phoenician states in what is now Lebanon to colonize North Africa, Spain, Sicily, and Sardinia. These traders settled along the coast of the island and intermarried with the locals, establishing the towns of Sulci and Caralis, among others. Carthage, another Phoenician colony that rose to become a powerful mercantile empire, would conquer most of the island in the 6th century BC, leaving only the mountainous interior to the whims of the natives. As the centuries passed, a hitherto little-known city-state on the banks of the Tiber River had been growing in size, threatening the Carthaginians as undisputed masters of the western Mediterranean. With Rome having united most of Italia after the Pyrrhic War, a clash of titans was inevitable, and from 264 to 241 BC, the two powers fought a heated duel for geopolitical dominance, mostly on Sicily and its surrounding waters. Despite their lack of experience with naval warfare, the Roman Republic proved victorious, wresting control of Sicily from the Carthaginians. Three years later, after the conclusion of that war, Rome took advantage of a mercenary revolt on the island and also seized Sardinia and Corsica. The island would be a lucrative, if not troubled, possession for the Romans. When describing Sardinia in his Geographica, the geographer Strabo noted that the greater part of Sardo is rugged and not at peace. Indeed, most of eastern Sardinia was so mountainous and inhospitable to civilization that the Romans were never able to completely conquer it, referring to this area as Barbaria. The Greek travel writer Pausanias describes the terrain as follows. The northern part of the island, and towards the mainland of Italy, consists of an unbroken chain of impassable mountains. And if you sail along the coast, you will find no anchorage on the side of the island, while violent but irregular gusts of wind sweep down to the sea from the tops of the mountains. The only name the Romans left for these towering heights is the Montes Insani, or Mountains of Madness. Most scholars seem to agree this appellation was applied to the imposing cliffs along the northeastern portion of the island, which, as noted by Pausanias, are tempestuous and home to many shipwrecks. However, today we know that the colony's highest point was Punta La Marmara on the Ginnergintu Massif, and others posit that the Montes Insani referred to the mountains running from the Ginnergintu up to the Margine Massif and the center of the island. One cannot talk about Sardinia's highlands without mentioning its highlanders. By far the most interesting aspect of this island's history is its fiercely independent native population. This group of austere, wild men truly had no friends but the mountains. And despite being so close to the center of the Roman Empire, they never submitted, and as such gained a malicious reputation in the eyes of contemporary writers, being referred to as thieves in rough wool cloaks. Strabo describes the Corsi, then inhabiting both Corsica and northern Sardinia, as being untamable even under captivity and more savage than wild animals leading civilized Romans to marvel at their bestial appearance in slave markets. Despite their reputation among the Romans as barbarians, these people were skilled builders who created thousands of impressive megalithic stone towers called Niragis, their sturdy ruins still littering the Sardinian countryside. Scholars have derived the name for their civilization from these imposing defensive works, dubbing them the Niragic people. The main Niragic groups were the Corsi, Balari, and Ilientes, and long predated the Punic occupation of the island. Of these peoples, Pausanias writes the following. When the Carthaginians were at the height of their sea power, they overcame all in Sardinia except for the Ilientes and the Corsicans, who were kept from slavery by the strength of the mountains. Some of the Carthaginian mercenaries, either Libyans or Iberians, quarreled about the loot, mutinied in a passion, and added to the number of highland settlers. Their name in the Corsi language is Balari, which is the Corsi word for fugitives. Shortly after the acquisition of the province in 235 BC, the Roman consul Titus Manlius Torquatus had to be sent in to pacify these highlanders. Though he earned a triumph for his victories on the island, two subsequent consuls would also win a triumph de Sardis, so we know their submission was not complete by any means. In 215 BC, during the Second Punic War, a local landowner from the town of Cornus, named Hempsicora, was emboldened by Hannibal's brilliant victory at Cannae. 
and led a rebellion of Punic and native peoples that was halted outside the gates of Corrales and then crushed at Cornus by a now elderly Torquatus. The second century BC offered the Romans no respite from native rebellion, and large-scale revolts would be more or less perennial for the next 100 years. Always losing to the disciplined and determined Romans, the captives taken in these brushfire wars greatly depressed the value of slaves in Roman markets, and a new Latin idiom was created, sarde venales, or Sardinians for cheap, which was used to describe anything of low value. Yet despite its reputation for difficult terrain and rebellious natives, Sardinia had its share of fertile plains, the largest of which is now known as the Campidanu, running through the island's southwestern corner. These plains were fed by several rivers, the Thyrsus, Sacar, Solkis, Flumini Manu, Cyprus, Kidrius, and Temus. The wheat fields fed by these streams ensured that the colony would be a major supplier of grain for the growing city of Rome being referred to along with Sicily and Africa as one of the three grain reserves of the Republic. The only downside to these rich agricultural lands were their endemic malaria, so much so that along with the rebellious natives, the island would mostly be known for its insalubrious climate. In addition to the fecundity of its soil, the colony would be only third to Spain and Gaul in terms of its metallurgical output, producing vast quantities of silver, lead, and iron. Most of the extant mines that have now been mapped appear to be between Sulci and Neapolis, centered around the town of Matala. However, mining seems to have also taken place in the southeast of the island, and as noted on the map, there resides a settlement called Ferraria, or Iron Mine in Latin. With the exception of brigandage by the native highlanders, Sardinia appears to have been quiet throughout most of the late republic and imperial period. No legions would be stationed there, only local auxiliaries accustomed to the climate. Despite its reputation as a place of exile and pestilence, its aqueducts, public buildings, and flourishing cities along the coast and in the lowlands attest to a high level of civilization. The citizens of Caralis, the capital of Sardinia at Corsica, and by far the largest town on the island with 30,000 inhabitants, would be granted Roman citizenship by Caesar himself as an act of gratitude for their support in the civil war. Sulci, the island's second city, would likewise be punished with a severe fine for taking the side of Pompey in that same conflict, though the city seems to have continued to prosper due to its proximity to the island's rich lead mines. At least two Roman colonies were also established, Turris Libisonis and Forum Traiani, both noted for their rich agricultural lands and baths. It is interesting to note that after Caesar, no Roman consul or emperor ever visited the island. The colony had become, in modern parlance, a flyover state. Its grain supply would eventually be overshadowed by more productive areas, such as Egypt, and taxes on silver mining would be imposed in the mid-4th century, making that industry less important as well. However, the Vandals would complete their conquest of North Africa, the city of Rome's breadbasket, in 439 AD, again bringing relevance to Sardinia as an imperial granary, until it was itself conquered by the Vandal king Genseric in 456 cutting off the blood supply of the Eternal City. So important was this once maligned province that the cash-strapped and manpower-depleted Romans managed to wrest it from the Vandals once more in 466 AD, the lights flickering as they entered into the very twilight of their empire. Within ten years, the Western Roman world would take its final plunge into darkness, their last emperor deposed by a Germanic warlord in 476 AD. Sardinia would once again be conquered by the Vandals and remain under their suzerainty for 80 years until being returned to the Roman fold by the Byzantines.